me let me do a topic right now. Uh, you know, I've got all those YouTube videos up, and I get correspondence from students and some faculty from around the world. It is fascinating. And I had a student ask me to explain the loanable funds market, if I could make a video. So I'm going to do that right now because it, it is part of what we're going to move through as we get into the liquidity trap and monetary policy and its failings, according to Keynes. Okay? So here we go. The loanable funds market. Loosely speaking, we're going to have money and the price of money, the interest rate. And we're going to have a demand curve and a supply curve like we always do in economics. And so here's the initial demand curve. You're going to see this again later. What is that demand curve? Who does that represent and what does it tell you? This is the demand for money. Who would be wanting to go up? Well, say again? I said as interest rates go up, the demand for money is less. And as it the the down, amount of money that they would demand or borrow reduces. As interest rates rise from 3% to 13%, the amount of money that is borrowed decreases. High interest rates. That's common sense, okay? This is, for the most part, this is businesses. Borrowing money for investment purposes. Remember capital goods and inventory, new construction. It also can, includes you and I borrowing money for loans, you know, for buying a car, buying a refrigerator, whatever. And then, so let's, let's just put a note over here. This is the borrowers. And then you have the supply curve. Um, we'll make it with a slope to it, supply of money. Who would that be? The banks are the intermediary. They hold it. Where do they get the money? From you and I saving. And in fact, even in businesses, a lot of businesses at times will have an excess of cash and they'll need to put it somewhere, hopefully earning some interest. And so they may be loaning it out in some of these short-term markets as well. So this is the savers, if you will. And between the two of them, their interaction creates, at least in theory, an equilibrium interest rate and an equilibrium level of borrowing lending. We call this what? Q star of money. Conceptually, that's the loanable funds market. And then what can happen? Well, if you and I decide we're very frightened, and so we start saving a lot more money, we stop spending we start saving more, what happens up here? We have an increase in supply, more money being saved. And so with the increase in supply, the equilibrium interest rate would reduce. Ideally, that would mean businesses would be borrowing more money. And it's kind of an offset to our fears. Business, we may be cutting spending, but businesses might be increasing spending through borrowing. Does that make sense to you, though? If you and I get scared to death and we stop spending, and as a result of our extra savings, interest rates fall. Now you're a business. Do you want to go borrow money and build more inventory? Yeah. If your customers have already cut their spending, why do you want to produce more inventory when they're buying less anyway? Yeah. May not. You may not. So this may not, you know, the shape of these curves is something we'll address when we get into the liquidity trap and, and uh, investment demand. By Keynes, as, as Keynes explains it. Um, what would happen if businesses became very aggressive and optimistic and decided to borrow more money? You'd have an increase in the demand for money, okay? Maybe out to here, which would put upward pressure on interest rates, but it would, at least in theory, increase the level of borrowing and stimulate the economy. Now, simple movements in borrowing and saving affecting the interest rate. Okay, so far? Pretty straightforward. Tell me about this latest move. If this increase in borrowing were not an increase by business, but an increase by government. Government says we need to stimulate the economy. 
And so they increase this level. What does crowding out tell us about that? How do you relate crowding out to that? They can borrow more at the high rates. Borrowing the government can borrow at high rates, higher rates than business, because they're not operating on a profit margin or a return on investment. They're competing with the businesses now for borrowing money? Say again? They're competing with the businesses? They're borrowing. competing with businesses, and the argument goes what? That if interest rates get bid way up, what? That businesses won't be able to afford the borrowing and they'll be crowded out of the market. And so you'll have an increase in government spending, but it's offset by a decrease in business borrowing and spending. And so that stimulus may not work. Does that sound familiar? We've talked about that before. That's crowding out. But when did we say crowding out is a problem and when is it not a problem? During the time of great inflation. Like when it, during recession, it's not a problem because why is crowding out not a problem during recession? Because those businesses probably weren't going to borrow the money. Yeah, to begin businesses with. probably weren't borrowing money anyway. Yeah. So, what about in the United States economy today? If the government undertook stimulus borrowing and spending, would that crowd out private investment? I don't think so. In the first place, businesses are sitting on almost two trillion dollars in cash today that they don't need to borrow. They've got the money now if they want to start spending. They're just not borrowing. They're not spending. Why aren't businesses uh, borrowing money and using it for more inventory and more capital goods? Why, why isn't more of that going on today? A, they're afraid of what's going on. What are they afraid of exactly? They're afraid either the economy is going to keep continuing to make a downfall or they're not going to have the clientele well, the, the word, first off, the unemployment is so high we don't have all the customers we wanted. But what's this fiscal cliff we keep hearing about? Oh. Effective the 1st of January, if Congress and the President don't come to some accord, effective the 1st of January, taxes are going sky high. The old Bush tax cuts are expiring. So all of us will pay more tax. And huge cuts in government spending. That's the fiscal cliff. That's the legislative legislation that is in, a, is in effect right now that's going to occur on the 1st of January. What's going to be the effect of higher taxes and lower spending? A lot of the fear, a lot of folks are saying, well, it's going to put us back into a double dip recession. You're going to see unemployment climb to that same. So if you were a business and you thought there was a potential for that fiscal cliff, would you be expanding your inventory? I think not. Okay. Are we recovering right now? Slowly. Interesting comparison between McDonald, uh, sorry, Walmart and Target. Walmart sales have not met expectations. Target sales have exceeded expectations. Can you explain why to me? Walmart has inferior rates. Walmart has inferior goods, but we're in a recession. You would expect, would you expect your sales to remain pretty strong? If the economy is getting better, they want their sales to decrease because people can afford more from places like Target. Well, what you're seeing is they're selling to two different markets. Target is selling to a higher income market. And those people are beginning to spend more money. The lower incomes see no hope for the future. And they're tightening their belts even further. That's what's happening. I heard last night on the news that uh, the, the wealthier were going to spend like 3% less than what they did last year. So I've heard similar arguments. And I think the wealthy are very concerned these days about the tax changes that are being proposed for next year. Uh, a lot of talk about limiting the amount of deductions they can have, which would raise their taxes considerably. So I think there's a little bit of worry there. What exactly does the President and the Congress have to agree on to prevent that? They have to come to some agreement on how they're going to move towards a balanced budget. And again, you know, what do the Republicans want to do? They want no to tax. keep them in place. They want to keep the spend. They want to cut spending and keep the tax rates low. What does Obama and the Democrats want to do? Increase tax They want to increase what they call revenue retaxes. They want to increase revenue collections. How? Taxes. Higher taxes on the wealthy. And they are very much in agreement, let's close some loopholes and try to revamp the tax law. Now, 
We have with us today a former student, Alan. I'm most welcome. Alan, you uh, have you finished your CPA? Yes, finished my CPA. Okay, Alan knows a little bit about accounting. Okay. Um, let's see if I can say this right. How complicated are our tax laws in the United States? Really complicated. Huge. Like they have a whole book about income. Around. Just to define income. Just to define income. Can you compare that with the tax code in any other country? No. No? Okay. Uh, one of the arguments we hear from, uh, from the right side is that our complicated, our, I'm sorry, they say our high taxes in the, in the United States are keeping businesses from moving here and starting up. The last study I just saw said it's not so much the tax rates, it's the complexity of the tax code that's so expensive to try to stay up with it and maximize your deductions and, maxim uh, and profits. So I don't know whether it's our tax rates or just the complicated nature of our tax code that's killing business. I can assure you, having filled out my own corporate return several times, it's a nightmare. So if one of the things that comes out of this debate over the fiscal cliff is to clean up our tax code and make it a little easier, that would sure be a good plus. All right. 